you have to get comfortable with getting out of the box. We, we can't just rely on learning about AI within our traditional domains. We have to be willing to learn about AI from resources that don't necessarily gear the content toward auditors. They may say, this class is for data scientists, wannabes, this class is for machine learning engineer wannabes. Obviously, we don't want to be machine learning engineer wannabes, but we're, we can use that knowledge anyway. And, and no downside, nothing but upside. So be comfortable with getting out of your comfort zone in that space. This episode is brought to you by Green Skies Analytics, an audit analytics service provider that works with internal audit departments that have data analysts and are still frustrated with trying to make analytics actually work, aren't getting the expected ROI, who can't break through the communication barrier between the analysts and the audit team, and those that need experienced direction for an audit analytics strategy and process. Those that feel like they've wasted time and money on trainings, aren't getting the value they want, not prioritizing the highest risk areas for the organizations, or have projects that seemingly never get completed. Do you deal with any of that? If you do, go to the show notes of this episode and click the Green Skies Analytics link or go to greenskiesanalytics.com to schedule a call and understand how Green Skies Analytics makes analytics actually work for internal audit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Audit Podcast. Today on the show, we have Julio Torado. He's a director of internal audit and compliance at Spirit Bank. Uh, Julio has been on the show before. I think he was one of our first-ish guests somewhere in the first 50, maybe. But Julio is known within the internal audit world, risk world, as an AI, machine learning, cybersecurity expert. He just kind of geeks out on all the latest and greatest tech and the risks. And then also we talk about a ton of the opportunities with AI, uh, specifically for internal audit. And so we talk about just AI in general, different types of AI, uh, the tools that are out there now, a quick update on chat GPT. And then where I really wanted to dig in was the use cases for internal audit specifically when it comes to AI and depending on what tools you have access to, what you can do with those. So that's super interesting. There was a, a new ish uh, use case that I haven't really heard before. So I thought that was really good specific again to internal audit. Uh, we also talk about hallucination risk management. Sounds like a fancy term. It's really not. Uh, so check that out. And then Julio is also an avid learner and he takes all these online courses. I know I've asked him before, like, hey, I, I want to learn about this thing. <laughs> what course should I take? And he always has an answer. And so he lists three courses uh, relative to AI and depending on where you are kind of in the hierarchy or where you want to be maybe in the hierarchy uh, of your organization. He offers recommendations on three of those courses. Those links are in the show notes. And then we close out with some of uh, Julio's closing thoughts. So with that said, here we go. I got asked this question two weeks ago, maybe. Uh, so we had Clarissa Lucas was on the show. Mm -hmm. Except she interviewed me instead of me interviewing her. Great and, episode. Uh, yeah, thanks. And so as we were talking, she's like, yeah, talk to me. Tell me like what different AIs, like what is, and I just went, look, broadly, I just refer to it all as AI because that's what the masses know it as. Uh, if you want to take AI experts, ML experts, and you want to take the academic folks and throw them into a room and let them fight over, well, no, technically it's this one and technically it's this one. But largely I just go, look, everybody else knows it as AI. That's how we refer to it. Now we have you, <laughs> AI expert on here. So I'll throw it to you for anyone that was listening to that episode and going, okay, that's great, Trent, but like I, I kind of wanted to know what the differences were. So um, I will throw it to you. Types of AI, walk us through what those are. Any examples that you could give also would be helpful. But uh, to kick it off, let's let's start there. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, I would, I tend to start at the highest level by differentiating between two big concepts: AGI, artificial general intelligence, and and narrow AI. And an AGI is, is a type of AI system that can handle a broad range of cognitive tasks in different domains. So in other words, it's, it's the most human-like AI system. You and I allegedly are humans, so we can do a lot of different things in, in many different domains. So an AGI system is human-like in that way. So by contrast, narrow AI, which is the type of AI that we have today all across the society, is the type of AI that is really good at one task or one collection of tasks within do one domain. So, for example, you, you and I both probably watch movies on Netflix or, or Hulu or Amazon. When you watch movies after a while in your profile, you'll start to see some recommendations. 
Well, those recommendations are a byproduct of a recommender system. That's a machine learning system that's specifically designed with a very narrow use case. So narrow AI is what we all have nowadays. An AGI system doesn't exist yet, but people are working on it. So you have companies like uh, uh, OpenAI, who, who, who made ChatGPT, DeepMind, owned by Alphabet. You got uh, Meta that runs Facebook. They actually are working on AGI. And you'll hear estimates anywhere between five years and, and 50 years. My literal money is betting on closer to five years. Um, but the, the point is, we don't have one yet, but it will happen. So, so from our perspective, we have to pay attention because, as, as you know, you and I talked about generative AI and ChatGPT ever since this thing became public last year or the year before that. And you also know because of that, it's been evolving a lot just over the last 12 to 14 months, right? So imagine when AGI X gets released to the public, it's also going to evolve pretty quickly. So you and I that have to manage risk and report to boards and other folks that have clients to serve, it's uh, it's important that we stay connected. But you can, from, from a practical perspective, what I, what I like to also say is, so as I mentioned, narrow AI is everything that we have today. You can break it down functionally by 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 further uh, dividing it into two smaller buckets, predictive AI and generative AI. So predictive AI is that recommender system that I just told you about. And generative, generative AI is ChatGPT. It's anything that creates content. So that that's a quick way, I think, to to, to break it up into pieces and, and make sense of it in, in a way that would hopefully all of us would understand. For the everybody person out there who's not necessarily AI expert, but just needs to know enough, do you feel like there, the differentiation needs to be made? Is there like certain risks with one to the other that we should be aware of? Or is it, is it, hey, when speaking to the board, like it's pretty okay just to say AI and then everybody understands, i.e., is, should I change my approach? <laughs> no, I, I, great question. My personal preference whenever we're conveying this content to a board or a directorship is to focus on the AI breaking down to predictive and to generative. I think that's the easiest thing to do because uh, num number one, there are frameworks that are being created, for example, by NIST, this organization that is now known for creating the NIST cybersecurity framework, the NIST AI risk management framework. Well, they're creating frameworks that break it down just as well. So that's consistent with frameworks, but I think it's easy to relate to predictive versus generative. You don't need an, a PhD in machine learning to, to figure out that out. And then you can also point out specific examples. Like I mentioned to you, recommender system is predictive. You can say that uh, a, a a system that, that involves, I don't know, a looking for fraud within like credit card companies all use machine learning for fraud detection. That's predictive. And we can specifically point to what everybody knows, which is ChatGPT that generates content. So the, I think that's that's a good way to make a connection. Yeah. Speaking of ChatGPT, and I feel like this question is going to age in about a week. <laughs> well, the updates on ChatGPT. For anybody that's listening to that Clarissa episode, I talked about on a Wednesday, I said, hey, this doesn't exist in ChatGPT yet. You know, don't worry about it or, or you know, whatever. Literally the next day on Thursday, I logged in. I'm yeah. Like, yep. It's there. So this, again, it's my age in a week, but quick update on there uh, on chat GPT. Yeah. You're going to have to shorten your development life cycles here with the, with the episodes. <laughs> yes. So maybe, maybe we can do trend is we can start by giving a little bit of a background. So open AI, that's the company that created chat GPT and that got released. Uh, I think it was in November of 2022 for the world, publicly for everybody to play with. And this was ChatGPT 3.0. Eventually, it was upgraded to 3.5 for the free version and 4.0 for the paid version, which is 20 bucks a month. That's what we have today. And I actually have the paid version so I can speak to it if we have any questions. So ChatGPT is a, is a product. GPT is the model. GPT 3.5, GPT 4, that's the model. And the way that I like to think about it is ChatGPT is like a car and GPT-3, 5, or 4 is like an engine. So huge distinction there. You may also hear it referenced as large language model. All that means is an AI model that is huge in terms of number of parameters, basically in terms of size, and it, it's designed to interact in natural language. So large language model is that GPT-3, 5, GPT-4. But in, in the industry, within our industry, within the industry of AI professionals, we tend to say L large language model or LLM synonymously with ChatGPT. So just keep that in mind if you're hearing this, right? If, if I say LLM, I, if I'm specifically focusing on the model, I'll point that out. Otherwise, it's probably referring to a product. But ChatGPT creates uh, a text, images, audio. Uh, it's used for a lot of different use cases. 
It's a, it's available to anybody with an internet connection, depending on your country. Uh, it, but the one thing about that's important to emphasize is that it's it's not the only tool that we have. So there are competitor products. There's Google has something called Bard. Uh, that it's comparable to ChatGPT. There is Microsoft's Copilot. There is Anthropic's uh, Claude. There is in, Inflection AI's Pi, which which it's an interesting. Pi is a little different in that the, the builders of Pi say that it's EQ-based, not IQ-based, meaning it's emotional. It's ideal if you want personal coaching, if you want to talk to a virtual therapist, which is an AI system. Now, I'm not ready to give up all my private emotional drama to to uh, to Inception, uh, but some people might, and that's okay. That's their choice. Uh, and then there's Perplexity AI, which unlike the others, is sort of like it's basically an AI-powered search engine. That's a competitor approach. It's an alternate to Google, Bing, and so on. So we have all these different options, and, and most of them basically do the same thing. The ChatGPT4 tends to be the more powerful model for now because they're all constantly getting better. It could be the second or third best in six months. Who knows? Uh, Google Bard does something that the others do not, and that is it helps you do video analysis. So, for example, I'm doing a talk uh, here in a few more weeks to a group of businesses, business leaders, and I'm going to show them how you can take uh, go, go to Google, Google Bard and I can put in a link to the latest you know compilation of Super Bowl ads and by then it'll be you know this year's Super Bowl and, and I'll say to them imagine you're a marketer or you are an, a, a you're a, you're a, a business owner who, who was about to create an ad and uh, as a part of that you can prompt you can look at the latest Super Bowl ad compilation and learn all those lessons get insights for well, all the things they have in common, things that are interesting, things that are curious, and translate that into recommendations. So you can only do that with BART, the others, and not as of yet, but that could change someday. So the bottom line is there are many, many tools beyond ChatGPT. So I, I think we all should experiment with all those, not just stick to one particular tool. I think the what the audience wants to probably hear the most, what I was super interested in also, is I know you've taken a lot of, hey, I'm in analytics or I'm in audit and I'm in risk. And all right, now how can I use these AI tools to more effectively and more efficiently do my job? And so I'm going to throw throw it out to you. I know you have a handful of these. Some are very unique. I feel like I, I'm relatively up to date on what these are, but I know there was one I just went, I have not heard anybody doing that. So uh, I'll just I'll throw it to you. Let's hear use cases, your favorite ones, uh, and benefits. You don't necessarily have to speak to the outcome because I know there's probably some sensitivity to those. But to the extent you can, obviously, people would appreciate that. So it, it may be a good idea before we talk about the use cases to do a quick sort of cautionary warning. Uh, anything you enter into the, any of these tools, uh, if it's private, if it's sensitive, if it's confidential, the PII, proprietary, you name it. It goes from your local machine through the untrusted public network known as the internet over to company access servers. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, there are some companies, uh, there, you know, f from when this first came out, you and I talked about this multiple times, but what's, what's a little different now is that these products that are originally available to all of us as individuals are now available to companies with enterprise packages. So for example, uh, co Open, no, uh, Copilot by Microsoft, they have this new offering for enterprise users who are willing to pay 30 bucks per license per month for a long time that that can actually use copilot within a secure environment they call it commercial data protection so you can actually access copilot within word that there's a little button up in the upper right hand corner or excel or so for those of you that are trying to use it for work purposes if your organization has some enterprise package it may provide security protections and in th that instance you may be more comfortable uploading things like an auto report, et cetera. So in the absence of that, assume no privacy or security protection. So keep that in mind. So I have I have different use cases. The, the one that happens the least frequent just by design is, is sort of helping me with planning strategy. So just to see if I have any gaps in my audit plan for the year and the risk assessment for the year and a, a risk assessment that, that gets performed before we do audits and the audit program itself. I try to build a comparable document using ChatGPT4 or Claude. Now also doing Copilot just to compare and contrast. The idea there is, and remember, I'm, I'm sensitive about what I provide to Gen AI tools, but the idea there is if I prompt this tool 
with, with, by the way, with a very long prompt, because an important lesson we have to learn early is that the better the prompt, the better the result. If I have a two sentence prompt into the, any particular tool, I'm going to get something. I just may not get exactly what I want. So my prompts are two, three, four, five, six paragraphs long, however long it needs to be to put in enough detail to get what I want. Okay. So I'll, I'll prompt to, to build a risk assessment for the annual auto plan and see, am I, am I missing a risk area? But I, it, when I, when I create the prompt, I also want to demand that tool access risk trends and developing issues that are happening that perhaps I haven't come across as much as I try to read. So that same premise for the auto plan, the same premise for the risk assessment that occurs at the audit level and as well as the audit program. And what you'll find is not only could you find something you didn't think about before, but you may actually, as it relates to, for example, the auto program, you may find a better way to word a procedure because these tools write better than I do. I have no shame in saying that. <laughs> so that's okay. Um, that's sort of the the less frequent use case. Now, trend I my <clears throat> so for now that's that's an optional thing to do. I, I don't need to do that. But I very much foresee a future when we have more capable versions like like GPT five, GPT six. Those things are improving by ten orders of magnitude in in capacity and in, in size of the model in in computational capability, all of them. Um, I very much see a future where you and I, any any one of those that are building these administrative documents, assessing planning strategy, if we don't do it without the help of that latest version, we're not going to be competitive. Uh, so I, I, I literally cannot imagine the implications of a GPT-6 with, with 4 being so amazing. So in the future, I don't think it'll be optional for now. I'm just toying with it. Um, summarization is another one. That's probably my favorite one because I love to save time. With what we do for a living, we have to read a lot. And, and there's so much content that I, I, I like to decide if I, I want to determine if I should invest time in it, I could summarize it that way. If I want to provide content for my audit committee, I could summarize it quickly. Uh, and and the one example that I think we can all relate to is, is uh, the, the, the IA standards. So um, when, when was the last time we had the, the most recent release? Was it like 2016, 2017? I think it was 17, yeah. 17, okay. So, so I remember back then that it took me well over two hours to read the dark thing great document lots of content but it took me a long time to read it and as i'm reading it i'm also like writing in a spreadsheet separately stuff so i can build a self-assessment template right because as you know i ain't got the kind of time <laughs> so i try to try to be efficient with what i'm doing so that easily took me at least two hours probably more let's go to just for the sake of being conservative okay so this year what i did differently with the powers of, ge of generative ai so i i I first of all glanced at the document. I probably spent about five minutes just, just to see the structure. You know, how is the structure? Where is the content? How are we labeling things? For a good old five minutes to figure that out. Okay. And then I uploaded, I uploaded that document over to ChatGPT4. Then I wrote a prompt to do two things for me. The first one was to build a summary because I wanted to use that information to convey to my audit committee. We have a meeting in a few days, so I want to give some summary information. The other one is I prompted it to, to generate and essentially extract key pieces of data, like make a list of every domain, every principle, every requirement, etc. And for each requirement, do a summary of no more than two sentences, because some of the requirements, as you probably know, are two or three paragraphs long, right? So I, I wrote the prompt and it, it, cre it created content within literal seconds. I also opened the spreadsheet and the content that it created for me in terms of the, not the summary, but what was extracted, so to speak, I copied and pasted that onto the spreadsheet, okay? So, so far, this whole process took about eight minutes. And that's me taking my sweet little time. Right. And now, if you stop there and, and make decisions based on that, you're being irresponsible. <laughs> that's not responsible AI. So I had to read the standards anyway. But here's the difference. As I read the document page by page, I compared uh, the content to what I, what, what I pasted onto the spreadsheet. And two things came out of that. Number one, I did this a whole lot faster. But number two... I saw zero hallucinations. That's a, this is when a large language model makes up stuff and it's so believable as to be as to be accepted, but it's actually completely made up. Well, I saw zero hallucinations. Um, did, did you have a question? Do a little bit more on hallucinations. So I, I, I feel like you might have breezed through that. It's a big risk area for people, especially if they don't know about it and they just go, "Well, ChatGPT said this; it must be right. Like it's it knows the entire internet. It, you know, it certainly can't be wrong." So talk about that just a little bit, uh, risks there, 
I know we're probably going to get into hallucinations in a little bit more detail later, but uh, expand on that just enough to where people can understand exactly what that is. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that. But before I forget, the bottom line with the standards is what took me at least two hours a few years ago took me about an hour this time. And those standards were significantly shorter than the ones we have today. So 2x that time, basically. Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't even think about that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So so hallucination is is a major challenge with any one of these these AI chatbots or LLMs or, or AI products that you use that create text, create content. It, it's, a, it's said to be a feature, not a bug, but it's still very buggy in that it impairs the way you use it. So, if, for example, if you if you use ChatGPT or Claude or Google or Google's Bard to create a story for your kid for bedtime, you want it to make up stuff. That's a perfect use case for hallucinations. That's but whenever fir- that was my first one. That's the first. As soon as I got on it, that's the first. I said, write a story about a frog. I forget what a frog and a something, <laughs> uh, and use these top two hundred most used words that that we learn when we read. And it, that I mean, my jaw literally just fell open when I saw it kick that thing out in 30 seconds. So anyway, sorry to totally. interrupt. Go ahead. No, this is great. It, it feels really magical the way these tools work. So so that's a great use case for the hallucination risk, which again is when, whenever the model makes up stuff. When it's difficult is when you're doing fact finding, like in the case of, of doing research about risks and, and, and looking for specific citations. So I'll give you a, a, a quick a quick uh, story uh, and then, then we can pivot. So right after ChatGPT was created, a, a, and you might have heard this already, Trent, an attorney used ChatGPT to create a brief uh, for, for the courts. Uh, he, he was representing a client in court. And apparently this brief, I, I guess he was arguing for some sort of a, a motion. Uh, it, it, was, it was a well-written brief. It was creative. It, it argued some strong cases. But it, it referred to specific cases, actual legal law cases, that, that w- would support his argument. Well, long story short, he got in a whole lot of trouble because it turned out that Chad TPT completely made up those cases, completely fictitious. So in hindsight, what he should have done was to first of all say, hey, this is amazing. Uh, thank God for LLMs. But also gone on to good old Google and confirmed that those cases are actually correct in real citations, right? So that was a huge lesson learned for the law community as well as for all of us talking about it. So the bottom line is hallucination is when these models make up stuff. So we have to, there are different ways we can manage that and we can probably get to that in a little bit if you want. And then one other note that I had, you mentioned that you, when you're doing the standards, you said, keep it to two sentences. That's a really good prompt. Something I like to use is, hey, keep it to, because if you don't limit how much it is, it ends up giving you probably more than you really need. And then especially if efficiency is your game and using it for whatever your use case is. I mean, a lot of, it's it's kind of, now that I'm thinking about this, it's like when you Google a recipe, best baked chicken recipe, and some the you know, there's three pages of, well, when I was a, a little girl and I was at my grandmother, and you get this, like, book about the person's life, and then eventually they go, and she taught me how to make this, you know, chicken recipe, and you go, okay, I just need the recipe and the ingredients. I don't need to know your life story. So it's similar to that, I feel like, where I, I a lot of times I go, I don't really need to know all that. Just keep it to two, three sentences. Um, so I did want to point that out uh, just as a, a practical tip for folks. So anyway, all right, uh, let's pick back to where we were. I think we were moving on to simplification and insights. Is that where, where we left off or where we want to pick up? Right. So, so yeah, so summarization for sure. So on the simplification and insights, I like to categorize that into just learning. So here, here's what I mean. I love to use these tools to take complex content and make it simple. So if I want to present to my audit committee on AI, I, I'll draft content, but it may be technical, and I may not em- empathize enough with my audit committee members who don't have a, that a background in anything AI. So I can I can upload it into any one of these tools and prompt it to create it. And this is specifically how you would write the prompt. Somewhere in there, you would say something to the effect of rewrite the summary for an audience without a background in X, and be more specific about the individuals that are receiving it. So the more specific, the better you get. Right, so so simplifying it for communicating to people, I think, is really interesting. Also, it's just for learning. Like, if you find yourself having to do something with like lease accounting or something that's technical that you've not experienced with before, by all means, Google away. But also experiment with with taking complex data and simplifying it so that you can understand it better. I think that's a developing use case. And the more we'll talk about some ways we can minimize hallucination risk to make you more comfortable and, and, and relying upon that. Uh, but I also like to. And this is what I'm doing more often than not, is, is taking something that's technical or complex and diving deeper into it. Sort of. Uh, so, so if I work for a for a bank, and we we have certain things that are very niche to banking. So one of those is called asset liability management. 
This is when banks do a variety of things to manage interest rate risk and liquidity risk. And and over the years, I've, I've struggled finding resources to learn about that stuff because it's so niche. And I don't want to pay $20,000 for a seminar because I'm cheap. <laughs> so, But this is an example of us using a tool like ChatGPT or Bard or Claude or you name it. And and, and taking content that you, you think is interesting or that you need to study, like in the case of interest rate risk, for example, and asking deeper insights, asking deeper questions, more technical questions, and going back and forth really in a conversational way. So from from complex to simple and to, from complex to deeper is sort of a way that I summarize using it to learn. Yeah, I like that too, especially when you have the, there is something that even when it spits out the answer, it could be there's a word or a phrase in there that's still very technical and you just highlight it, copy, paste, explain this to me like I'm five or explain this further or I, don't, I have no idea what that means. It's like having an expert sit with you and you just ask it questions, except you never feel like you're asking a dumb question because that's exactly it. it doesn't matter at all. Now, I only laugh because that's exactly what I say. Explain yeah. it to me like I'm a five-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, then go off from there. <laughs> I found it in, uh, I ask it a lot of stats type questions. And when it comes to like the five-year-old question, it's always like, imagine you have 10 Lego blocks. <laughs> I don't need the Lego analogy just to, you know, so uh, every down together, like, all right, explain it like I'm a senior in high school then maybe or something. Exactly. A hundred percent. So I, I love that because just like you said, it's like an assistant that helps you Dive, de, de learn on a continuous basis. And I, I, every every single day, I ask myself, "Is this a use case for for, for Dan AI?" I, I was in uh, not to divert too much here. Uh, I was in front of my house one day, and I, I realized I, I have a big tree in, in one side of my house. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge. I mean, I, I don't know if I can call it. It's a tree. It's a it's a medium sized tree. Okay, but the point is, I need to trim that stupid thing, and I needed to know what species it. Before I figure out how to trim it, because some trees are very particular, so I took a picture of the tree, uploaded it to ChatGPT on my mobile phone, and prompted it to tell me what species it was. And of course, within three seconds, because of my connection, you you get a response. So there's so many use cases that I think we're all still figuring out on a day day by day basis. I, I paid thirty dollars a year for an app to do exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> we moved into a new house and I had all these shrubs and flowers, and I was like, I don't know what this is. So I, I, this was three years ago. $30 a year for this app, and I just went around taking pictures, and it would go, okay, water this thing this way, do it this way, uh, cover it with a sheet, you know, if it freezes, and now it's just, you know, yeah, there's 30 bucks a year that I save, so that's nice. And, and you know, and that brings up an interesting but maybe unrelated comment is that creates competitive pressure for the app builder. So it's sort of the, the creative destruction element of the of our economy that we have these new innovations, and, and the, the, offsetting, the offsetting issue to the benefits we enjoy is impact to business jobs and so on. So it's an interesting thing to manage. So so learning for sure, and I'll finish up by saying, uh, if any of you guys have difficulty dealing with any managers, if you have an audit client that for any number of reasons is difficult, maybe, maybe the person's moody, maybe the person lacks empathy, maybe the person just hates auditors, who knows? Whatever the issue is, you can actually use these tools to craft messages more more convincingly, more persuasively. You can, you can write a prompt, again, as long as you do it safely without giving up any kind of private data, write a prompt that explains the situation, explains the behavior you're dealing with person X, and, and prompt it by saying, uh, provide some recommendations to more effectively communicate with person X. And not only can you do that when you're writing a prompt, you can enable, and I'm specifically only focusing on ChatGPT, you can enable the audio version of the app, of, of the mobile app product on your phone and talk to it. Do the same prompt, prompt it to give you recommendations. You'll get a long list of recommendations. And then you can go the next step. And this is the really fun part. You, you can take it to the next step and say, okay, now you role play as, as person X. I role play as internal auditor. I want you to be difficult. I want you to be argumentative. I want you to be anti-audit. And, and, and let's go back and forth on this particular problem. And now I'll try to implement your recommendations. And then 5, 10, 15 minutes later of talking back to this large language model, you may find that you will have practiced your soft skills you have learned some things, and as long as you don't mind giving up your voice to data to, to open AI, which is exactly what you're doing, you'll have this experience. I, I don't think like anything else. It's honestly a very cool feature because, as you know, for a long time within the auto profession, anytime we have a list of the top skills that we need to work on, almost always soft skills is, is in that top five, right? So what an interesting way to practice that piece. So, so the last use case I'll mention is for my audit committee. Every two months, I give them a newsletter. And, and uh, so one month we do an audit committee meeting, next month with a newsletter, then the audit committee meeting. So throughout the year, they're constantly informed. 
And my newsletter is it's honestly no more than three pages. The goal there is to share emerging risk information. What are the trends? So I'll I'll address something on third party risk management or some new regulatory issue and so on. You know, five, top ten questions for directors to ask on cybersecurity. Lots of stuff that I think is relevant. And what I prior to Gen AI, what I would do is I would I have a long list of sources from which I get these articles, and I would find the articles and I would read to them, and, and then I would I would I would for example take a a ten page article on say corporate governance. And condense it to like 300 page, 300 words. You know, shrink it up real, real quickly. Uh, but that takes time. It takes time for me to read and synthesize and conc- and concisely put things together. And so, what I decided to do is, is use generative AI to process the the article that's 10, 15, however many pages, and condense it to X number of of, of words that I need to fit in my specific sections in my in my newsletter. Just like you said earlier, you know, one of the things you like is that you can prompt the summarization to be the size that you want. Well, I do exactly the same thing here. So I do that, and with the prompt, I'm specific to emphasize things that I want to emphasize. There's things that I want to highlight within that summarization. So it gives me what I want, okay? So the summarization saves time. I, I also use any number of tools, whether it's Copilot or ChatGPT, it just depends on my mood, to create images to go along with the articles. So I'm using generative AI to create images and to summarize content. And I'm, I'm easily saving a, a decent 20%, maybe more, of the time that I spend and building this, this bi-monthly newsletter. Let me ask you a question, because I mainly just hang out in ChatGPT um, for the images. I know there, if I'll say, hey, create this, you know, a logo or create whatever it was that I'm doing. Whatever it comes to, for whatever reason, if I say, hey, I'm speaking at this, you know, IA chapter, it always spells something wrong in the, like, in the logo that I put. So it'd be like, IIAQ, you know, Lower Manhattan chapter or whatever. I'm like, where the hell did Q come from? So have you found specific to image generation, because I'm not a creative person, so I I would need that. Is there a, a platform that you'd like to use over uh, the another one? They all have those issues. So what I would say is the way, first of all, it's a function of the model. So the if you look, uh, so ChatGPT's ability to give you images is created by something called Dolly 3. Dolly 2, its predecessor, was far worse. Everything looked like complete gibberish. At least now the content you get may have English and a few misspellings, right? So what you'll see is that as these models get better and better, you'll have less of these issues. So the way I try to combat it is twofold. Number one, I compare and contrast the model. So I'll, I'll I'll create an image to ChatGPT4. I'll create an image to Bard. I'll create an image to Copilot. With the same prompt, different tools, and see which one gives me exactly what I want. Also, when you write the prompt, put in quotations the specific wording that you're trying to display. That helps minimize the risk of having gibberish. Not 100% perfect, but it reduces the likelihood you're going to get gibberish to display. But between that and comparing, I think you make it to it. Perfect. All right, I know we hit on hallucination risk uh, a little bit earlier, but and we want to take a little deeper dive in there. So I want to give you that opportunity now. Let's talk through hallucination risk management. So that that's probably the trickiest issue for us whenever we use these tools to to make decisions for creative things like like you know the 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 nighttime story for your kid. Who cares? We want it to hallucinate. So for decision making, this is a tricky deal. Uh, uh, there's a few things. The first one is prompt engineering is is key. So prompt engineering, for those that don't know, is a term that's associated to basically describe different ways you write your prompt. There's different styles of writing. So you got like the persona pattern, which I use almost all the time, where you say, uh, you know, you are a a 20-year veteran in data analytics in this industry, specialized in these particular skills, focusing in this particular area, now do X, right? If you write a prompt like that, we're using that persona pattern, then you're, you're going to get something that's better that if you just say do X, so there's that. There's um, a chain of uh, thought pattern when you break down a complex issue into multiple subparts. There's a few shot prompting, which is when you give examples of what you want and then say, give me X. And sometimes you do a combination of both. And a lot of my prompts are a combination of at least different prompt styles. So prompt engineering does a lot for reducing hallucination risk because as I mentioned earlier, the better the prompt, the better the result. If your prompt is vague, you get it. There's this wide window of possibilities. If your prompt is more precise, you obviously narrow you out. So that that's the first thing we should do. The second thing is to, uh, um, what's the term? Oh, or, um, retrieval augmented generation. Uh, you might hear RAG for short. So that's a term that describes when a company that has 
you know, AI engineers or data scientists, they have technical staff uh, on hand. They can take an open source framework, like, like Meta. Meta, the company that runs Facebook, has an open source framework called Llama. So you can take an open source framework uh, of open source model, an open source large language model, meaning it's accessible to everybody without paying any money. You can take an open source, freely available large language model and deploy it in your environment, but refer it to some internal database of stuff so that in a way you're almost fine tuning your model to be more specific to that particular data source. So like in the case of Bloomberg, they did that for and refer their open source model that they use to the database of all their articles so that they don't worry so much about all that hallucination stuff. So obviously we that use the web version don't have the option to do anything rag, but we can do rag like, meaning, so you know how I told you with the IA standards that I summarized this year, how I had zero hallucinations? Well, that's because I uploaded the entire PDF file for those standards, right? If I said to it, go to the, uh, uh, give me a summary of the standards and that's it, it's going to make up stuff invariably. But if I refer to an authoritative source, like an attachment or a website with a link, then I reduce hallucination risk for sure, not hypothetical. The other way <clears throat> that I reduce hallucination risk, and sometimes, honestly, I'll use multiple methods, is by, is by using multiple LLMs. So I mentioned to you, we got ChatGPT, we have Claude, we have uh, Copilot, we have Pi and so on, although I don't use Pi very much. Um, you, can, you can take your prompt or whatever thing you want to do for audit or for work, for personal, and copy and paste it onto all those different LLM tools and see what kind of output you get. I've done a lot of testing with this with like factual inquiries, and the majority of the time, they all come to the same conclusion. For some percent of the time, they don't. And a very tiny percent of the time, they all give you the different answer. It's very interesting. But the majority of the time, <clears throat> they give you the correct answer. So that's a way for you to gauge, you know, how do you, how do you minimize the uncertainty? It's almost like, like I mean, this is in a, way, it, in a way, it's similar to like going to a doctor. We all know about the notion of getting a second opinion, right? When it comes to an, <clears throat> excuse me, a major surgery, like ACL surgery for me, which I have, I've had both many years ago, I went to multiple doctors before I, I decided to go under the knife, okay? So I think it's the same approach. Go to multiple LLMs, get different opinions, and that way you, you narrow the uncertainty and manage the hallucination risk. As well as when I think of you, I think AI, cyber, and ML expert within the audit and risk world. Like that's what I think of when I think of you. If I, you post something on LinkedIn or whatever, and I scroll down and I say, Julio, I go, yep, yeah, he's the AI, he's the ML, he's the cybersecurity expert. Um, but the other thing that I always think of is because you are such a learner, in general. And so you're reading all these articles even before you had them summarized and you would read 15 pages and summarize as 200. You always know, and you it seems like you're always taking a lot of online courses. And, and, and probably one of the number one questions I get randomly asked on LinkedIn is, hey, I want to do XYZ with analytics. Do you have a course that you can recommend? And so I know you are like, you're basically the course guru, in my opinion. I know there's going to be a lot of questions about, okay, you said this, how can I go learn about this? And I like structured courses also. Um, so I did want to see if you could, what's kind of the latest, greatest courses that you've taken relative to the topics that we've hit on. And then obviously any of those that you mentioned, we'll, we'll mention or drop in the show notes, but give us your, your course load for the year. Uh, well, you don't want that. <laughs> the course. Uh, well, let me, let me recommend three courses that I think are perfect for everybody. No technical requirements needed. No, no, you don't have to be a developer or an engineer. If, if the challenge here, if the, if the problem we're trying to solve here is to educate the masses on AI, all the internal auditors and risk managers, the first thing I recommend we do is take this class called AI for Everyone. It's offered through Coursera.org. You can access it for free, and I always recommend people do free stuff if they can. If you want to pay a fee, it's like 39 or 49 bucks one time. That gives you a certificate. It gives you some questions or some quizzes. But you don't really need it. Get it if you want to. But access it for free. And every, every AI for everyone, it, it, like, like the name implies, is, is designed for all, all audiences. Every auditor, every director, every CEO, I think should take this class. Because you, you understand what are the different types of AI and what are the implications? What, what can companies do with AI? Not just know these terms, what's actually practically, uh, what can be practically implemented with artificial intelligence tools. Uh, there's also one called a generative AI for everyone, also offered via Coursera. You can also access it for free. And that's actually one that came out maybe three months ago or so. And it's 
like the name implies, it's about Gen AI. You, you have to take that one so you can get more comfortable with not just ChatGPT because there's so much more. As we now know it based on this conversation, there's so much more than just ChatGPT. So generative AI for everyone, I think is really good. No background in anything technical required. You just have to be curious and spend a little bit of time to, to learn, learn the content. The, the, the last one, the third one is going to be uh, generative AI, uh, navigating generative AI, a CEO playbook or a CEO toolkit. I think it's a CEO playbook. Also, okay, good. That's also offered via Coursera. Again, you can do it for free. That one is, like the name implies, it's designed for, for CEOs, but it's honestly a practical for anybody that's curious, particularly anybody who's in leadership. What makes that one a little different is that, and I believe you have to pay the small fee for this feature, is that it actually has prompt challenges. So it will tell you and help you write certain prompts to do all sorts of things in strategic planning and resource decisions. And there's various use cases. So I came out of that class with a better, clearer view of how a CEO or an executive leader can use Gen AI for the strategic high-level stuff, not just the sort of in the weeds kind of practical things. So those three, I, th I think, are great. And once you guys cover those, those at, le at least one of those classes, but if you can do three, that's even better. It, once you cover that content, I think you have enough foundations in AI to be able to decide what's the next step that makes sense for me. Maybe maybe it is a technical path, and then you can write code and do things. Maybe it's something that's more domain-specific, like in the case of banking. You know, in the banking world, we have a lot of material about AI and banking. Gen AI for banking. Maybe that's really the next step and you focus on your domain. I might add a fourth resource and that would be uh, this episode. <laughs> I think that's we a covered a lot of it here. Uh, but with that said, what do you, is there anything left? What do you want to leave the audience with? Do you have any closing words for the audience? The first one is, is there's one thing that I've learned over the last few years is that for internal auditors and risk managers, it's still tough to upskill in this space. So I hope these courses are very helpful for sure. And huge kudos to the to the IA for what they're doing with providing resources in a central place pertaining to AI. Uh, but we, once you cover that stuff, you're going to find that you'll want more information and you'll be hungry for more content. So Coursera is an example. Udemy is another one. edX is another one. What I want to tell people is you have to get comfortable with getting out of the box. We, we can't just rely on learning about AI within our traditional domains. We have to be willing to learn about AI from resources that don't necessarily gear the content toward auditors. They may say, this class is for data scientists, wannabes, this class is for machine learning engineer wannabes. Obviously, we don't want to be machine learning engineer wannabes, but we're, we can use that knowledge anyway. And, and no downside, nothing but upside. So be comfortable with getting out of your comfort zone in that space. The other thing I'll tell you is, so I've, I've been an internal audit since 2007. I have been to countless, countless IA meetings, ISACA meetings and ACFE meetings. And of all those meetings, I've only found one other auditor that also practices Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> so my call out to all you guys out there, no matter what your profession, but especially if you're an audit or risk or compliance or security or an analyst, get your behind over to your nearest Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy and learn to grapple. So not only is it good self-defense, but it's a phenomenal exercise. And, and, and you know, we have stressful jobs, right? We got to deal with politics and all these different things and friction. It all melts away when you're either getting submitted or submitted to somebody else. <laughs> so great exercise, great stress management. Find, go find your local jujitsu academy. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Audit Podcast. Whatever platform you're listening on right now, I'm sure there's a subscribe button somewhere. So please hit the subscribe button there. If you're listening through iTunes or Spotify, feel free to go give us that five-star rating. It only took me about 16 seconds to give myself a five-star review. And it really helps to get future guests to come on the show. So we'd really appreciate that. Lastly, be sure to check out the show notes and follow us on all our social media channels on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on TikTok. Also, if interested, please sign up for our weekly newsletter from the Audit Podcast. Thank you all. Have a great one.